kind of noticed that as we've discussed consciousness in the last few videos, there's been a, a number of things have been mixing together, as it were. Uh, different kinds of ways of thinking about ourselves encourage us to use words one way or another. So we've met phenomenal consciousness or the what it is likeness of qualia. But we've also talked about things like the spotlight of attention in the uh, theater model, the global workspace model. Um, phenomenal consciousness or the reality of subjective experience and the term awareness, what you're aware of, and attention, what you're paying attention to. These concepts kind of get muddled up sometimes. They're notoriously muddled in our psychological theorizing. And you'll notice that we seem to have something of a language problem here. So we, always, we often speak of consciousness of something, or awareness of something, or attention to something. Now, if every time you use the word consciousness, there's always an of something, then that doesn't really leave you with any grasp on consciousness itself. It makes it into a kind of a container, as it were, somewhere where you put the contents of consciousness. Same thing with awareness and attention. If we try to speak of these as nouns, as things in their own right, we get into difficulty. But they're the everyday terms, awareness and attention are the everyday terms with which cognitive psychologists and clinical psychologists work. So here's an example which is relevant, for example. We get uh, weird symptoms following damage to one side of the brain. So typically, if you have a stroke, it tends to affect one side of the brain rather than the other. Um, and that leads to sometimes very strange problems. Some of them are easy to understand. You might be paralyzed on one side, for example. But there's sometimes a phenomenon whereby someone exhibits what's called unilateral neglect. That is to say, it looks as if they're paying attention only to one half of their visual field, yet through testing, you can verify that they can see in both sides of the visual field. So here we seem to have a conflict between what we believe the person has available to them in their visual field and what they can access or pay attention to. So here you can see some drawings, for example, where patients with this were asked to reproduce a drawing, which is bilaterally symmetric, and they, their drawings show that they're attending to one side versus the other. It gets more bizarre than that. You might find such a patient would put on makeup on one side of their face only. Or they're eating dinner, you come back, and half of the dinner is gone and half it's still there, and you say, are you finished your dinner? They're like, no. You turn the plate around and they carry on eating. And yet, when you do tests like shining lights and holding up fingers, they can report back under those conditions from the side that they don't seem to be paying attention to. This shows you that the notion of seeing and the notion of attention are, have, a, have a complicated relationship. And the manner in which we consider the processes of attention will affect how much sense we can make of this rather peculiar situation. Another place in which attention plays a serious role is recognizing that we, um, as we go through life, we acquire many, many skills. And some of them start off what we might call controlled, that is, where we're carefully doing everything. If you're learning to juggle, for example, I throw one ball up, and then I catch it, and then I throw another ball up, and I catch it. This is not going to be good juggling. You can see that because if I have to pay that much attention and control things that much, I'll never learn to be a juggler. But, but as a juggler, I'm acquiring the skill to make that automatic. So controlled processes, which is quite typical when you're starting to learn something, they require intentional effort. You've got to pay full attention to them. Your consciousness is full of them. Um, Things are done one after the other, first this ball, then this ball, and it's slow and it's clunky and it's error prone. As you get better at something, it becomes kind of automatic. There's little or no intention or effort. The movements become smooth and graceful. There's very little going on consciously. 
It doesn't seem to require a lot of attention. So you could be doing something which to someone else looks incredibly difficult. You could be doing it and still humming a tune at the same time. And the idea is that this is very fast compared to the slow nature of the control processes. So look at this guy, for example, who's very, very skilled in using a kettle and a bunch of teacups. If he stopped to think about what he was doing, <laughs> it'd be a mess. Or consider this skilled use of the hula hoop. There doesn't seem to be a lot of reflective awareness, a lot of thinking going on here in the skillful use of the hula hoop. Rather, it seems to be almost automatic. But when we speak of such skills, we should remember that the skill doesn't necessarily always lie within the person. So this is obviously a highly skilled behavior, but it's a behavior that can only be done together with other people. Think of the skills of a professional footballer on the football field. They are skills, but they're only skills which can be manifest in the presence of the other team, in the presence of a match. Likewise, the skill of the person on top here is nothing without the person below. So as we're studying this, it's useful to remember that we have very many skills, but they're not all necessarily inside us, but represent somehow our mode of being in the world, the way in which we can exploit the world.